Hey guys, this is Ron. So this is video 10 of our series on rediscovering the pro uh, C programming language. Um, in this video, we'll talk about the use of strings uh, inside of our C programs. Now, there are a lot of different functions and a lot of different things to talk about with strings. Uh, I'm only going to cover a few of them, and so I'll leave uh, some of the rest uh, for your own uh, kind of discovery. Because, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, this video would get extremely long if we talked about all the different things and all the different functions uh, surrounding uh, strings in C. I will, however, talk about a couple of things that I think are important, uh, and then hopefully that'll get you kind of moving in the right direction. So strings in C, uh, you can define them in a couple of different ways. And depending upon which way you define it uh, is going to uh, affect whether or not you can update or change uh, the string or not. All right. So we can have a character array. Uh, and so I have an article here from Tutorials Point, And that shows a character array where each of the individual characters, you know, are stored in the uh, array. And then at the end, there's this null terminator, right? And this indicates that this is the end of the string. And that's how C is going to figure out um, that you've arrived at the end of the string. Without this, you can run into some problems, right? And so we always need to take into consideration whether we've allocated enough space uh, for our null terminator, whether uh, we overwrote our null terminator. Lots of different things can happen. Uh, and if that is not there, you know, you can have some pretty unexpected results. Now, additionally, we don't have to necessarily define uh, how many uh, characters you're going to use. C can figure it out. When it compiles it, it knows, that, okay, if you need to store hello, uh, I also need to allocate space for the null terminator, and it'll do so, okay? And then you can just, you know, work it just like you would a normal array where you can uh, allocate uh, or index into the various characters starting from zero and heading out, right? And so in this article, they talk about a couple of different uh, functions uh, that you might see. Now, I want to note that the functions that they use, you shouldn't use, right? So they're stir copy. Well, in my document, you know, I have stir copy, but you should really be using stir n copy, right? So the difference being is that this one, this version of it, so if there is an n version of it or an n variation, whatever you want to call it, you should probably be using that one. And the reason is, is this one takes an extra parameter uh, that basically indicates the number of characters that, that are going to be copied or the number of characters that are going to be combined, you know, whatever it is, there's some kind of, uh, you know, parameter that's going to define that. And that's important because, you know, with C, we can pretty much do whatever we want, whether or not that's actually what we want. Meaning that I could overwrite the end of the string and just start writing into, you know, you know, additional, you know, areas of memory that I don't, you know, potentially own, which could cause a seg fault. Or in a lot of cases, um, you know, this is how buffer overflows happen. This is how people hack a program and get it to do things that it's not supposed to do because we have all of these functions that don't consider, um, don't consider how many characters they're copying. Uh, and whether or not what they're copying it into can actually hold that many characters, right? So this is a huge gaping vulnerability, you know, potentially in your program. Um, so you should be using the, the version that at least lets you uh, specify the number of characters or something to that effect, right? Just an extra piece to try to secure our programs as we're writing them. So it's really easy really, really easy to make a vulnerable C program when we start working with C or when we start working with strings and, and copying data in and out uh, of different memory areas. And so 
I implore you, if you can use the n variant of the function, use the n variant, right? So Sterlens, not such a bad one. Um, I see that used all the time, but I see no good reason to use stir copy. I see no good reason to use stir do so on and so forth, right? There are a lot of different uh, functions that come with a an updated uh, n variant one, right? And so if we look and we take a look at our man pages, we can find a lot of different string functions. And again, you should be choosing one that has an extra kind of parameter in it. So if we go to the uh, command line, we can do a man three string and we'll see all of these different functions and an explanation of what they do. So in the case of uh, stir copy, like we saw in the uh, tutorial, uh, it's going to copy a string from source to destination, right? Now, if destination is smaller than the source, we've now made a buffer overflow. We've now written more data into destination than destination was dis was designed to hold. And so we've overwrote another portion of memory uh, that uh, we weren't supposed to, right? Now, there's a n version of it. So there's a stir n copy. Uh, let's see. By strncpy there we go there is a size tn so copy at most n bytes from the string source to the destination returning a pointer to the start of destination so this should reflect the size of destination and more than likely it should actually be the size of destination minus one so that um, we don't end up uh, overriding our null uh, terminating byte, right? So again, uh, if there's an n version of this, you should be using that because it's going to specify the number of bytes to copy, right? And without that, we could end up overriding uh, memory that we didn't mean to override, right? So lots of different functions in here that we can use, uh, but whenever given the option, you should use one that at least has that uh, end variation, right? Same with uh, uh, stir cop or stir compare. You should be using stir end compare, right? So when you're comparing two strings, All right? So lots of different functions in here uh, that we could use, and I invite you to go ahead and re uh, read about each each one uh, as you start programming more. Know that you'll have to include strings.h in order to use these functions, okay? So if we come back here, that's basically uh, talking about C strings needing to be null terminated. We saw a character array. We haven't yet uh, seen character pointer. Uh, so this would be like char star something. And then um, we could basically assign us a string to that. Um, and what we'll find is if we do it that way, you cannot uh, change the value um, that, or the, the, you can't change the string that you've assigned there, okay? So again, lots of different functions. Invite you to read about them. If you can, use the one that, you know, has uh, some kind of uh, size parameter uh, that you can use, okay? So let's uh, see what it looks like to build uh, some of these character arrays and see, you know, which one does in fact allow us to update it and what that kind of looks like. So if I quit out of that, we'll call this uh, strings.c and we'll go from there. So pound include stdo.h, just like we always do. So we can do print f. We'll do main function. We're not going to pass anything in. And here we'll define uh, two strings. So in this case, we'll do a char star string one. And we'll just call this our first string. So it's going to contain first string. Okay. So we have the double quotes indicating that this is a string. And so we're assigning first string uh, to this uh, character pointer, right? And in this case, uh, we'll do one as an array. So character uh, string two or char string two. We'll do our brackets and we'll call this C 
second string. Let's go ahead and print those. Percent uh, S. String one. Go ahead and copy and paste that. Make this string two. And we'll return zero because everything ran correctly. And we'll write it. Okay? So all we've done is define <coughs> string one and string two. This one we uh, defined is just a char pointer. This one we define um, as um, you know a character array, right? Both of them contain a string, and we'll be able to print both out. So let's go ahead and compile that, and we see it does in fact work. Okay, so let's go ahead and try and change a value, right? So if we did uh, string two, and let's say um, we're gonna change the first character, which would be zero. Um, and we'll make this one just a capital S, all right? All right, and now if I yank that, paste it, we should be able to print out two. So we recompile, run it, and so in fact, we have updated our string. Okay, cool. Too easy at this point. Let's give it a try and try to change the first one. I'm not gonna bother trying to print because I already know that I'm going to break, right? So I was able to print out my two strings, and then as soon as I tried to change string one, uh, it broke. And why is that? So let me set it back to the way it was. I'm gonna recompile. Should be able to run it. Everything runs correctly. So I'm gonna use a couple different programs to kind of you know, tear this apart a little bit. So XXD is a program that allows me to um, allows me to basically tear apart a binary or really anything for that matter and it displays the individual bytes of the program the memory uh, location that, that that's in uh, and it also displays you know some ASCII stuff here to the side so if we uh, use grep so we're going to pass this to grep and look for first We'll see our first string is there. What about second? So we also see second, but we also see it's a little bit weird here, right? So first string showed up real nice like, second string uh, not so much. But let's look here at the addresses. So if we notice that uh, the addresses that first string falls in is around 2000 and the second string is around uh, 1100 1200 somewhere in there right there's another program that we can use to kind of tear apart the binary as well and this is um, our string or, or our program itself is considered an elf right so this is an elf binary because I'm compiling these on Linux and so I use a program called readelf and I can look at the various segments of strings. And hopefully I've written this all down correctly so that we don't get too far into the weeds, but essentially we wanna look for the different memory addresses that we saw. So we saw around 2000 was our first string. And this is a part of the RO data or read only data area and so we should expect just by the fact that it's named RO data, it probably got stored in an area that's read only. Um, whereas the uh, other one was stored somewhere in the 1000 to 1100 area, which puts it in line with text, right? So text is the actual executable program. And we know this because this portion is executable and and by the naming dot text, I know that this is our actual code that we wrote for the program. 
So second string is a part of the code in our program, whereas first string got stored in an area that's read only, right? And so I can additionally take a look. So we know the first string is in read only area. I can't touch that. Um, so there's no change in that. That's why it segment faults each time. But I can also do an object dump. So this is another program. And I can indicate which area I want to disassemble. Disassemble, probably misspelled it, um, equals main. So our main function, we're going to call this strings. Um, I'm going to go ahead and specify that I want it in Intel syntax. And so what we should see, and I'm going to pipe this to less, is our main function, right? If I slide down, I see a couple different calls to puts. Now puts is, when we called printf, uh, it actually replaced it with puts when we compiled it. And so I should see uh, right about the time where it loads uh, RAX. So we see uh, our base pointer, uh, minus 20 hex, that's about where uh, ace, our first string got printed. Then we printed here as well. So this should be first string because this is the first call to uh, puts. And then now we're loading in um, RBP minus 16 hex uh, into RAX and then call puts again. So this one should be um, where our second string is stored. And we can validate that. Uh, we see RBP here getting loaded with RAX. So here RAX got loaded. So if I take this, and what I think is pretty cool is I can copy that and quit out of here and go into Python just because it's easy. And I can import bin ASCII and I can take a value I'm going to store it as a bit string. I'll copy that value in, getting rid of the 0x. And then I can do bin ascii.unhexlify. And we'll put our val in there. And what I see is it's backwards. But if I reverse that, we see the beginning portion of second string, right? And it's backwards because you know I'm s the the typical machine nowadays, like your home computer, this and that. These are uh, little endian machines, and so it actually writes the bytes backwards, right? XXD was nice that it automatically puts it into a format, you know, when it displays it on the screen, so that it makes sense. But when we were looking at that raw uh, code, it's still in that um, in that. Uh, little endian format so everything is backwards right so we can see that our program itself loads the second string which tells me especially because it was you know the place it was loading it was rbp minus you know something so it's stored on our stack within the program so the main function has a stack and so it's loading it onto that stack, which means I can change it because that's an area of memory that we can update, right? So in our program, this is why we were able to update string two, but we're not able to update string one because string one exists in an area of memory that um, that is read only, right? I found that cool. I'm sure somebody you know who's watching the video would say, okay, that was dumb. I didn't need to know that, but I found it helpful as you're starting to debug things, you know, why does, you know, why can I update this one but not update the other one? And when you start digging in under the hood, you start to find out, okay, well, one got stored on the stack, one got stored in an area of memory that's set as read only. And it's all because of the way that, you know, I specified this one. This one I specified as an actual array, so it built it on the stack. This one I specified as just a char star, and I was not then able to update it afterwards okay so so that is that and uh, we'll move on from there
So what else? So we've seen lots of different functions that we can use. Uh, I can find the, the length of my string. So if I wanted to print f uh, length of string one percent ld, all I have to do is call strlen, strlen, right? And I can specify string one. And if I compile this one, so quit out of Python, make strings, and now it's telling me, okay, you tried to use stringlen, but you forgot to import string.h. So let's go ahead and import string.h. Pound include string.h. I'll write that. Go ahead and recompile. And it works. So I can see that string one is 12 characters. And if I look back, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So that works. Now let's go ahead and change this to string two because I want to show you something. And I'm going to specify another string. This one is the third string. And I'm doing this because I want to show you how you need to be careful about your null terminators, right? So we have string two. Um, and I'm going to go ahead. Actually, let's do it with string three. So tested this out a little bit ago. So hopefully it works again. But I think it drives home the fact that, OK, we have these null ter terminators and we need to be careful with them, right? So I'm looking at string three here and string three has 12 characters, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, right? Because we are starting at zero, this is actually index 11. So index 12 is actually that null terminator. So let's take a look at that. So if I do a print F, uh, last char percent D so that I can see it, it's actual decimal uh, number and we'll do string three and we'll do index 12. And so if I've done everything right there, I should see, we do in fact see a null terminator at the end, which is good. Now, what happens if I overwrite that null terminator? So we will take string three, character 12, and I will place in there an X, right? X marks the spot. And so what, I'm gonna copy this, paste it down there, and we're gonna go ahead and print uh, three. And so we should see our X at the end. And let's go ahead and compile that. And we'll run it. And oh, look what happened. So because of the way that it's stored on the stack, uh, when it allocated space for both string two and string three, this null terminator is what sat between the two strings. And so when we overwrote that null terminator, when we go to print string three, it ends up printing string three and string two, right? So you gotta be careful about how you're using your strings and making sure you don't overwrite that null terminator or you'll find yourself in a world of hurt, right? You can get some unexpected results. In this case, we just end up printing two accidental strings um, and we haven't done anything to damage string two at this point. So we can still print string two just fine, but string three is definitely, you know, kind of messed up when we try to use it correctly, right? So now if I did a stir len on this, it wouldn't give me uh, 12, it would end up giving me, you know, probably 24, uh, 25, you know, uh, characters, right? And so again, pay attention to your null terminator uh, or you could find yourself in a world of hurt.
Now, there's another thing again, and I pointed this out before is making sure you're using safe functions. So we had um, stir copy and we had a stir end copy. So if I did stir copy and I put string three in here, but then instead of uh, passing it something that's gonna fit, um, I could end up doing something like this string is much too large. This might actually even break our program. So we'll find out. That might actually be way too large. And so what's gonna happen is it's going to try to fit this whole string in string three, overriding string two in the process. And so if I uh, go ahead and copy these, oops. If I go ahead and try to copy these and put them in here, I'll go ahead and compile. And already it's throwing some, some errors. So, ooh, I'm trying to write 29 bytes into region size uh, 13. So it's already seeing that there's gonna be an overflow, right? Now, had I um, not had any warning flags turned on, so if I was just straight using GCC, tack O strings, strings dot C, at least in that case, GCC was still smart enough to um, go ahead and and still warn me, but you, you have to be careful because sometimes you can still do these things. GCC can't quite tell that, you know, that's what's gonna happen, um, especially when I'm allocating memory dynamically, uh, quite possible uh, that I could do that and GCC wouldn't be able to figure it out, right? In this case, it knows exactly how large these are and so it can tell. Right, but let's go ahead and run it anyway. And in my case, it was too large and it detected that because I, I, uh, uh, I broke my stack essentially, right? There, there's a little canary that it puts on there to try to detect um, an overflow where you may be trying to overflow a return address. And if that canary changes, it says, hey, Stack smashing detected and it terminates the program. Now, if this had been just a little bit smaller, uh, I would have just overwrote string two. So notice string two in this case is much too large. And it was probably, you know, this one of these last characters that E maybe overwrote that uh, canary, right? So if I uh, got rid of this is large, right? This string is large and I compile that. It does sense an overflow, but this time it doesn't overwrite. It's not big enough to overwrite the canary, but it's definitely big enough to overwrite string two. Okay. So again, you should be using uh, stir n copy, not stir copy, All right? And so this is uh, an overflow. This is overriding uh, null terminator. And these are all things that C allows you to do. So if you're you know, not paying attention, um, not um, putting some kind of protection in there, uh, you're definitely gonna find yourself in a world of hurt, all right? Um, let's go and see if there's anything else we wanna cover. There are times where you're gonna want to use a couple extra functions. Uh, I wanted to point them out. Um, let me slide down. So other use for functions, string or sturtle. This is one that I've, I use quite a bit. Uh, there is uh, a function called A2I. So if we look at that, man A2I, it says convert a string to an integer, right? Um, you can use this, um, and I don't even see that in here it says not to use it, but A2I does not detect errors, right? And so I would not 
invites you to use this. So it does indicate that you should probably be using Sturtle. Um, I think in my man page or in my thing, I put two L's. It's probably just one L. Um, that's probably man Sturtle. Maybe that's to long long. Yeah, so that just makes it a, a longer integer. So there's Sturtle and there's Sturtle, which is a long long. So you can fit an even larger number. This is the version that I would use, right? So it creates a long long int instead of just a long long int. But either one of these is definitely going to be better than A2I. And the reason is, is there's a lot of, lots of different things that you can detect in here. Um, so you can specify a base. Okay, I, I want base 10 for you know a decimal number, right? So that's useful. And then you can keep track of uh, the string that you're passing in. Um, and let's see, I think NPTR. Let me look at this thing. NPTR. Function converts the initial part of string in NPTR to a long integer value according to the given base, which must be between 2 and 36 inclusive uh, or be the special value 0. The string may begin with an arbitrary amount of white space as determined by is space, followed by a single optional plus or minus sign if base is 0. So you can kind of walk through this, but essentially we end up passing our string in uh, for this first value, but then we also pe uh, point in a pointer to a pointer and essentially this is going to be, it's going to indicate where it stopped um, in NPTR. So in our string, there might be digits with maybe a, a letter in there, right? So it's going to try to do its best to convert the beginning portion into a number. And if it doesn't, if it stops uh, at some point, NPTR will point to that stop or that point where it stopped in the string, right? So that's one check we can finally do. Hey, did it get to the end of the string? Um, and if it didn't, we know there were some extra digits in there that were not, or there were extra characters in there that were not digits, right? Additionally, uh, there are there is some error detection going on. So if we look at the return value, let's see, function returns the result of the conversion unless the value would underflow or overflow, meaning you know uh, if the they specified a number that was too large for us to store. If an overflow or underflow occurs, meaning it's too negative, uh, Sturtle returns long min. If an overflow occurs, Sturtle returns long max. In both cases, error no is set to E range. So again, there's some error handling that we can do. And if memory serves me right, they have an example down here of using uh, Sturtle to convert some numbers. So yeah, they're using A2I up here, but later on, they actually use Sturtle uh, in one of these. Uh, probably passed it right there. So sir toll their string end pointer and So this end pointer is just a char star. So they start out with a uh, character pointer and They pass in the address or the address of that pointer. So now you have a pointer to a pointer their base is base 10 uh, Should be I think they're converting to 10 here so they're trying to determine a base which they're specifying from the command line um, or they set it to 10 right so if they don't specify anything on the command line they're passing in a 10 so we saw this kind of syntax in some of our early videos uh, where it's a ternary operator with the question mark uh, and the colon there either way it should be you know passing that in and that's what they're passing in as the base and so this val should be, you know, what actually comes out. And then they do some error checking down here. So first they check to see if error no was set to E range. If it was set to E range, they know that it was either under or over, meaning they specified a number that was too low or too large, so on and so forth. 
and then they even check uh, let's see NPTR so they check NPTR and see if it's equal to uh, the string if so no digits were found right so it stopped at a character um, and and didn't work oftentimes I'll even go and check to see if n pointer points to like a carriage return so the slash n meaning they entered a number and then hit enter and so it should have stopped on that carriage return right and so again that's another check to see okay did it not only did it get through the first part of the number it went all the way to the end right and so Sturtle allows you to make these checks whereas a to i uh, doesn't do any of those things and so you really have no idea if what they entered uh, is correct and so um, in in this I, I really wouldn't do that right um, in this case they're checking it against the null terminator um, and they talk about you know that that should be after the slash n um, I think that's what they're saying either way they're checking for because you're passing in a string string should be null terminator uh, so it should be you know null terminate at the end if like I was saying where it should be a slash n that would be if they manually you know if your user using your program manually entered something and then hit enter so the string that it gives you still has that carriage return on it and then after the carriage return you would see this null terminator right so depending upon how you got the string it, you're either going to find a null terminator uh, at end pointer or you'll find that carriage return right um, but again, I would use Sturtle over uh, A2I any day of the week, right? So what we can do, um, let's see, what time are we at? I'm showing we're somewhere around 37 minutes. Um, I'm going to move on from Sturtle because we're pretty late in here. And I just wanted to bring up there's ways of getting input from the user, right? So you see a lot of old code. Well, hopefully you don't see it anymore. Uh, using something called fgets. Uh, you'll see a lot of old code use. Well, old code really is probably using gets. And this is this is terrible. If you look at gets, this is kind of like uh, what I said before, where there's certain functions you shouldn't be using. And gets is definitely one of them. So if I do a man on gets, this is how we get a string from standard input. Notice it's deprecated. And notice it also says never use this function, right? So just like we talked about with where we can use stir copy and end up overwriting our string and writing into memory that we didn't intend to do, because there's no check in place upon how much data we're going to copy, gets is going to take whatever the user types in, right? And so, you know, you have no idea if they're going to write 80 characters or they're going to write a thousand characters. It's just going to take it and it's going to dump it into whatever you put in this char star, which is definitely going to lead to a buffer overflow of some sort. So never, ever, ever, ever use uh, this function, right? Instead, there's there's other functions out there that we can use, such as fgets, get line, get c, or get char. You can even use scan f uh, to get uh, to get input. But this is another one that you have to be careful with scan f. Uh, so if I do a uh, man on scan f. Uh, it is essentially you're going to take a format string. So just like you saw with printf, where we had like percent %d, percent %s, you know, those sorts of things. Well, you can build something like that. And when the user types it in, it's going to place it in those things that line up with the percent %d or the percent %s, right? Um, and so if you're not careful there, you can also cause an overflow. Now, there's ways of building these format strings so that it'll only take uh, five characters or 10 characters or whatever. In our, um, we did a video on, 
Let's see. It would have been one of our video eight arrays and pointers. In that video, I did a uh, a uh, multi-dimensional array, and we ended up building like a times table. Well, in order to specify the width that I wanted each um, uh, number to print out as, I did like percent 3D. And that meant, hey, make sure there's at least three spaces here so that everything is spaced out nicely. Well, you can do that with strings too. You could do percent 50S, meaning that I'm only gonna take 50 characters when they um, do, uh, when they input their, their string, right? And so that's one way that you can kind of clean it up. But again, if you, you know, mess this up, you could end up hurting yourself in the end, right? But like I said, there's there's lots of other functions that you can use, like fgets or get line. So if we do m man of fgets, and we can see the fgets uh, input characters or input of characters and strings, right? So fgets is going to take a string. Uh, you can specify a size, which should be the size of this thing, right? And then where are you getting it from? So in our case, like standard if. So if we look at fgets, it reads in at most one less than size characters from the stream uh, and stores them into the buffer pointed to by s. Reading stops after an end of file or a new line. If a new line is read, it is stored into the buffer. A terminating null byte slash zero is stored after the last character in the buffer, right? So again, it's gonna read in at most one less than size so that it can store this uh, slash zero uh, in there as well. So it's making sure that it can store that null terminator in here. So what does that look like? So if we quit out of this, uh, let's do uh, get input and we can pound include stdo.h and let's look at the man page. It says we only have to include stdio.h in order to use uh, fgets. In main, we're not going to pass anything in. Let's call this char buffer and I'll put 50 characters in there and I'll just go ahead and close it out. So I haven't initialized it at all. So it could, it right now essentially has garbage in it. But what I can do, uh, if we look at how to call fgets, we can copy this. I'll paste that in and we'll just update it. So it's gonna return something pointed to character A. So what I could do is char star temp and I'll say temp is equal to f gets we'll pass in our buffer because we specified our buffer uh, here as an array uh, and we're in the same function where it was built we can do size of buffer otherwise I can just put that 50 in there and where am I getting it from? I'm getting it from standard in. So if I print F, I can do uh, percent F or not percent F, percent P. And I will see, well, let's just do it as percent S. So we'll do our actual string and I'll do this as our buffer. And percent S, this is temp turn zero. All right. So if everything works right, what did we call this thing? We called it get input. So we can do a make get input. And I can run it and automatically it waits, right? So it's waiting for my input. This is a test of the em emergency broad cast system. Hopefully I've got, you know, roughly 50 characters there. Well, apparently I had uh, under 50 characters, right? So it took the entire thing. What if I flood it with characters, right? So notice this time 
it only copied up to, it was about to overflow that buffer. It put the null terminator in there and moved on, right? And so both our character uh, and our uh, buffer, or the buffer and the temp all point to the same thing. So why does temp exist? We do man f gets. I'll look for return. Uh, let's see, return value. F gets returns S on success. So basically it's gonna return uh, the, the string that it just made and null on error or when end of file occurs while no characters have been read. So let's try that out. So if I run our program again, I can hit control D and that sends essentially a, um, an end of file and notice I segment or I faulted right there. So if I look, which one of these faulted, right? So I'm gonna assume this worked, but this did not, right? So if I comment out that one, and I re, uh, yeah, make, get input. So it tells me that I'm not using temp, which is fine. I'm gonna run it again. I'm gonna hit control D. This time it works and it doesn't segment fault. The reason it's pretty garbage again is because, well, I didn't initialize it, right? So if I initialize it with just a zero, so now that buffer is full of zeros. I'll make get input and I'll run get input. I'll hit control D and it works correctly, right? The reason this seg faults is because I'm trying to print temp, and right now temp points to a null value, right? So what we can do is we can do something like this. If null is equal to temp, f print f, I'll send this to standard error. So we saw this function in our uh, one of the previous labs, probably reference and values. So lab nine, uh, we're gonna just say uh, no input received, All right? Let me do that. We'll close that out, close that else. We'll print our buffer. All right, so all we've done is we tested temp to see if what was returned was null. So null. If so, we print out an error. Otherwise, if there's actually something here, we know that buffer got filled, so go ahead and print it out. So we write that. I'll go ahead and up arrow, recompile. We'll run it. Does it still work? This is input. Yep, that works. If I run it again, this time I'll hit control D. No input received, right? So there we go. So that's one way uh, to get, uh, get input. Now, one thing I do wanna point out, and it's getting really late in the video, is that the inputs uh, or standard in is a buffered interface. And so if we ended up trying to write more into buffer, then what, uh, you know, if the user put more characters in than we were willing to accept into buffer, then they still exist in standard in. Which means if we were to do something like this, and uh, we'll do this line again, and we'll go ahead and just, basically copy the whole thing over again. So we're essentially gonna try to get input again and write it again, right? So you would think it would prompt me a second time. So if I make input and I'm gonna run it. So test, okay, that worked. Test two, that worked. Okay, cool. But what happens if I write more input than it was expecting? Well, notice here my program stopped because I got all of the input. It took the first 50 characters or so, or 49, 
and put those into buffer and then it went back to read again well there were already uh bytes sitting there waiting to be read and so it just automatically pulled those instead of prompting my user again so that gets kind of tricky sometimes in order to uh be able to to kind of fix that uh, i'm not gonna go over that in this video because i'm already over 50 minutes 50 minutes but there are a couple articles out there uh this happens to be one that i stumbled across just kind of playing around they talk about using poll select or iocTL in order to detect whether there are still bytes there ready to be read all right and so if that was the case for me I would do something to the effect of um, if I knew that there were bytes there right and it, and I did it via testing out in some way shape or form like they kind of talk about you could do something like this uh, while let me specify oh, man. We'll just do a character garbage all right and we'll do this as garbage equals get C so get get character so uh, man get C uh, it's gonna take a file stream so we can put standard in again uh, is not equal to um, let's see EOF uh, and garbage not equal to uh, slash zero so it's either you know the end it's probably EOF is probably all I, all I need I want to go all the way to the end um, actually probably in so this is when they hit enter right so while that is going on I'm essentially just gonna put a semicolon there and so it's just gonna keep looping there reading character by character and dropping it in garbage until it gets to EOF or it gets to a uh, carriage return character so what does this look like so not a, not the greatest implementation um, but make get input okay so we'll run it again and we'll see test test two test three okay so it kind of broke our program uh, didn't quite work the way I was hoping uh, so let's put a test in here uh, let's say if sterlen of uh, buffer is equal to um, what is our max buffer size 50 it has to have the null terminated character so if it's equal to 49 we're gonna just make the assumption that they overwrote the end of the buffer now they could have wrote 49 characters and so this is again going to break our program but what i'm trying to get you to see is that if you were to go through tests see that there's bytes there waiting to be read you knew they overflowed and you could do something like this because i'm not testing it i'm just going to make the assumption that hey if there's at least 49 characters in the buffer it copied as much as it could and there's probably uh input waiting okay now i gotta bring in string.h all right so this is getting a little crazy pound in include string.h we'll go ahead and write we'll try to compile again this time it takes it so we'll do test test two and it works right so this time it did a sterlen on test and said okay well it's definitely not uh, 49 so they're you know they didn't override it so that's good but if instead we know that they override it okay well this is this is good it stops so test two and it works right so what it did was it copied the first 49 characters into buffer it tested to the length of this buffer said oh it is 49 
So read in all of the additional characters into garbage one by one before proceeding on to prompting for the next one. All right, so little tricks you can kind of put in place. Again, this is a probably a terrible way of doing it. Um, you really wanna go ahead and test, um, but uh, I'll leave that one up to you uh, as I haven't tested this one out. But that is a problem that people have obviously conquered. Um, and so uh, if you run into it, a little bit of Googling, you should be able to come up with a solution. So if I go back, I think I've covered just about everything. Uh, lots of string functions we can use. I would use stertol over an A to I. Uh, there is stertope, which is tokenize a string. So uh, let's say this is the string I have, break it up. I can break this into three different strings if I passed in that I wanted my uh, delimiter to be that space in between them, right? So. Uh, if you're used to Python, Python has a way of uh, string.split and you can specify the character you want to split on. This is very similar to that, except for this will destroy your original string. So the first time through, it will return break and it puts a null terminator there. Then you run it again, it'll return it because it put a null terminator there. And then the last time through, it, it will send up. Right, and so you end up getting, uh, you loop through it and get three different strings, but your original string is now broke because it essentially replaced these with null terminators, right? And so I invite you to read about string toke. So you might copy the original string into some kind of temporary string before breaking it up if you want uh, to keep your original. So this video has gone way too long. I knew it would. Uh, and I apologize for that, but there's tons and tons of things that you can do with strings. And we only t uh, touched, you know, the, the just a, a little, little bit of that. But again, uh, long video, uh, and uh, I seriously doubt anyone is still listening at this point. So I'm just going to call it quits at this point and uh, hope something was informative to you. I'm probably talking to myself at this point anyway. All right, take it easy. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.